Welcome to Come Follow Me 2022. This is session 11, Genesis 37 through 41. And always remember to hit that like and subscribe if you haven't done this and you love our stuff. Help us out there and help us to be able to continue these sessions for you. I'm not saying it isn't a commitment, but we love doing them anyway. And so. And for those of that are watching for the first time i am Robin oh that's Pickering. true and i'm feral <laughs> just you so go. you know that's all good <laughs> okay you remember that the whole thesis of our whole presentation for the whole year is isaiah 46 remember the form of things of old for i am god and there's none else i am god and there's none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and i will do all my pleasure so I wanted to just start with that because in this one, we're really going to apply the visions and interpretations of Joseph's dream and dreams, plural, and the other dreams that he interpreted because we want to actually share with you what we believe to Amazing be prophecies. the end <laughs> yes. from the beginning. Let's just jump right in to the first dream of Joseph, wherein he said unto them, Hear, I pray you, this dream that I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaves arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my sheaves. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So right out of the gate, you know, it's kind of a difficult thing when when somebody has a gift that some of the rest of us are envious of. You know, it's, it's a hard thing sometimes for us to not let jealousy win out. And that's kind of a side note, but I just wanted to note that it's not uncommon for us all to experience jealousy. It's what we do with it that counts. You know, we experience the feelings, but you have to move past them. Then we have the dream that he dreamed for his parents involved. And even they did not understand the dream. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made obsolete. Obesence? I'm sorry, I'm, having, I'm tripping up. <laughs> to me. And he told it to his father. And to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and your mother and thy brethren indeed bow down ourselves to the earth? So this question, you know, it's kind of real, and it's kind of seems arrogant on Joseph's part, but but sometimes the truth isn't arrogant, it's just the truth. So that being said, you realize that the dream actually is a window to... Joseph's mission, that he would be, and we know that it was fulfilled later in his life, but I'm going to propose to you, it is also fulfilled in our day. And just recently, we had a sign in the heavens that showed that we're at the changing of the guard. We actually did a video. So before you go to that video, can I point out that I think that it's amazing that the sheaf wasn't standing until after and Joseph, and we'll, we'll just do this right out of the gate, you know, Joseph is going to be a type of Ephraim. And, and just like we talked in our last lessons about the father setting the, uh, the precedent for his descendants is, as an exemplar, um, what we're going to be looking at is the willingness of a people to descend and that descent well, comes before the sheep goes up. Yeah, so again, he goes through know? his descent phase when the jealousy of his brethren caused him to be sold into Egypt. And then he's, once again, he's betrayed and and placed in jail. And right. anyway, he goes through this great big descent. Years. <laughs> and I'll even get into something else towards the end when we go into the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. But it's really awesome to understand that he is in a position to to serve a lot, but before that service, he goes through an incredible sacrifice and descent. 
I just wanted to point out that if you're familiar with our stuff and you're familiar with uh, the changing of the guard video we did, and that's been a while, so I won't stand behind everything we may have said, but I will say that the concept is <laughs> yeah, absolutely I, I like Hugh on track. He Nibley <laughs> said that he, if he doesn't agree with something, he says three years ago that that's yeah, that, not that subject, because Yeah, it's not accountable. Yeah, Because we changes. learned, thankfully, yeah. we're all learning. Exactly, so, right? So we're going along the way. But conceptually... Um, conceptually the concept is true that we have experienced signs in the heavens and things that have happened that is absolutely showing the changing of the guard and one of those signs was the sign of revelation 12 and i'm going to play a short clip that i played back in that video of changing the guard just so you can see that the sign was fulfilled in 2016 and it was a fluid thing Everybody likes to say, well, the sign was 2017, but the sign started. That it happened on a dime. Yeah, that it happened on a dime, but it actually started on 2016 and went through and was closed out in 2017 right. when the child was delivered. Anyway, so it was a year long sign. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. This event that took place in 2016 and 2017 that was the sign of Revelation 12 is such a beautiful thing because what you have is it it actually starts at trumpets in 2016 where the moon is right at her feet in Virgo, which in this instance is a sign of the woman being um, us, the church. The woman is the church. Anyway, this sign takes place and, and it is birthing the kingdom that's what joseph smith taught us in his translation of revelation Revelation is that the kingdom is being birthed here and that this birth actually took place you know three months later the jupiter enters the womb of virgo and it stays there nine months and then it's birthed on 2017 on trumpets so this sign took place over a year's time and it's it's a marker along with all the signs that if you followed our work you know that there was many signs that begin with the with the tetrad and the, the blood, the moons, blood and moons and everything that started taking place at, in 2014 and comes forward. And then we have the sign of Revelation 12. Then we have the eclipses. And it's like in the Book of Mormon times when it says many signs and wonders were at coming about. But then it said that people begin to doubt those signs because a lot of time had gone by. And they, everybody, we're all impatient. We we think in very um, today mode, you know. And well, sign event. Man. Yeah, sign event. And really, if you look at the signs of Christ's birth, 
it was 33 years before they seen any outer evidence that that it had actually transpired in this right. in this land and that's true for this too these these signs were given then but it's like we we wanted to see instantaneous things happening well it's not so hard to see that they're starting to happen now we're seeing lots of signs but and wonders coming but the signs coming. precede yeah they the always event. precede the event right. and if you go to our our video changing the guard and even though we did that quite a while ago, and so not everything in the chain yeah. of the guard well, are we going to stand behind because I we're think most of it's what, still correct. Oh, I think so too. Absolutely. But this idea that the guard is changing, that the the gospel now is going to move to the greater house of Israel. You know, we kind of went from the Jews to the Gentiles. Well, when the gospel was taken out to the nations, it started a new phase of the gospel yeah. plan. And, and it's the same plan that was from the beginning, but it has phases. And, and it was uncomfortable to some minute, of the yeah. apostles of old when Paul was going out. Oh that, my that goodness. Was, you know, it was uncomfortable to So many changes. To Peter Circumcision, and whether it was okay uh, to yeah. eat with Gentiles. And know, so, so many. this change, this change in the guard that is that is happening as we as we speak actually things are happening and we see a lot of things changing in our world and it's a little uncomfortable but we're going to a different phase the millennial day is going to be a different phase for all the youth out there that's a good thing you know yeah. Yeah, we, we often think you know oh, every, the earth's going to end you know <laughs> yeah everybody gets a little... no it's going to become a paradise it's going to it's amazing what we're going to have the opportunity Right. to participate in we're living in an exciting time and it's going to be a little stretchy in the beginning but then we have the and, millennial day and just like in joseph's dream you know that this the sheaf wasn't standing up at first it stood up and then the blessings came i think that prophetically joseph as a father and as a type of the descendants of joseph the like we talked about last time the king exemplar concept in isaiah he's showing us a picture of what the mission of ephraim will be like we will have a descent phase we will descend before we rise yeah and, and joseph was an example of that joseph of egypt because oh, he went life. through a total descent for most his of his life. life until he was in there and just like with joseph of old um that he represented a situation where where he went through that descent and then they did bow down to him that fulfillment took place once already but just like it says in isaiah 46 i will show you from old the things for the future and we're seeing that dream in the sky yeah. in so our day in revelation you know? 12 you have that yeah. taking place and it's showing that the mission of joseph and the mission of ephraim is to bless we should not be arrogant, but we should be in a position where we are like it was at the time of Christ when he says the greatest among you is the servant, servant of all. Of all right. Not getting too bogged down in that because we got a lot of stuff to cover and we're going to hit it more as we go along. So I wanted to just get to this word increase. And the reason I bring up increase right at first in the Hebrew, the, the Yod Shema Pei, that is the root of Joseph's name. Increase is his his root word. And as we look at the meaning of that, like in the translations, it's more, it's increase, it's also, it's exceed. To add increase, make more, do again, it's all increasing. Well, the reason why that is so important is you understand that as we start to put it all together in its context, the work supporting the word, the action behind the word, pronounced Yasuf or Yasuf or I, I hope I get that right that being said don't don't expect me to be the guy who announces things. <laughs> announce things right <laughs> not my forte that being said if you take his this increase and you pull the yod to the right remember Hebrews always right to left and you add the vav in there that now you have added God into his name or into increase, actually, is what I really meant to say. You've added God into increase. So you have the Yod Vav, uh, and you have Joseph, meaning Jehovah has added, you've given the, the increase prophetic utterance. And that's Joseph's name. It's beautiful when you take it into context. 
of Joseph of old, interpreting the visions and dreams and doing all that thing. And then in our day, we have our Joseph. And when you get into Second Nephi 3, you know, where it, where it names all the Josephs and everything, what you realize is that this isn't just, you know, Rachel adding children. You know, this is, it, it is that. It's always true on the very plain surface level. But symbolically, what you have is God's plan, His eternal plan that He established before the foundation of the world is being fulfilled phase by phase. He's adding and adding and adding again. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Yeah, and you know that the name is relevant because in our day we have the dispensation head, Joseph Smith, who had the same gifts, who was given the gifts to bring about this prophetic utterance for us in our day. It is the hand that supports the mouth, meaning it's the hand that's secured firmly and supports the prophet I mean the prophetic voice it's that's Joseph and so it's no wonder that God had miraculously him named Joseph Smith that he was actually a type of the Joseph of old and that annunciation is Joseph uh, very close it's hard to even hardly tell them difference the increase and the name Joseph I'm going to pass the baton yeah, to Rhonda here quicker. but before I do I wanted to I wanted to kind of do it my way <laughs> <laughs> which is we learn differently Rhonda and I learn differently she comes and, and, and the actual word in mathematically is she's an algebraic girl which means concept 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 right. concept I conclusion elementary school you, you know, know adding the and me I'm a HP guy I I and you know in the old days this would be a knock I'm reverse Polish logic on a calculator which means that's actually what it's called it's actually it's called reverse, reverse Polish, Polish. You in my days being Polish was a joke controls. but <laughs> but <laughs> to go backwards but, I say backwards you but say actually it, it's it's a sign of brilliance I'm sorry <laughs> no <laughs> anyway <laughs> reverse true. Polish means that you you take a concept and then you add the function to it and so I'm kind of a I kind of like to look at the end and then build the, the groundwork, and right. she kind of comes from the groundwork to the end. And actually, we're chiastic, yeah. meaning she does the building, I do the end, and so we're chiastic. You do the overview. Yeah, the overview. And, I do the. And I put in all the detail. Which is just our nature, and I have to conceptually wrap my head around something. Anyway. Long and short of that story was just to tell you that I have to tell you where she's going before she builds a picture. <laughs> so that if you're like me and you learn the way I do, you're following along. Like, why okay? are we doing this? <laughs> anyway, so this is really about the dream of the baker and the but or the butler and the baker right. that she's going into here. But she's coming out of algebraically. But just so you know. I have to know where we're going before we start. So <laughs> this is about the dream, and we're actually so going to get there. So what we're going to do is we're going to just lay some pavement here. And what my what my hope is is that by the time we get to the butler and the baker's dream, you're going to be able to see meanings in that in those dreams that go far beyond anything that you ever supposed was actually in so those verses. Away. So okay, the first thing that we got to talk about though is. Um, that the fact that Joseph was being as he was sold into Egypt as a teenager and actually died in Egypt because, you know, they're going to take his bones with them when they come, when they leave during the Passover. Um, he spent most of his life outside of Israel. And so he was amongst foreign nations. And Ephraim and Manasseh, they were born there. They, they were born in Egypt which is a type of America in Isaiah in the last days. And so um, Ether chapter 13 actually lays that down very beautifully, that just as, as that, that Joseph went, Jacob went down into Egypt, so Lehi came to America. So we're a branch of the house of Joseph here in America. But the point that we need to make here is that we've been by symbolic birth as Joseph's sons were, as Ephraim was, born in a nation so, besides Israel. A few years back, we presented some stuff, and we actually says that, you know, 
we're among the Gentiles, and I kind of offended somebody, and they come up to me afterwards, and they says, "We got a patriarchal blessing. Yeah, we're, we're, Israelite. we're, we're Israel. Right. We're Ephraim. We're That's Israel. not true. And then, so we're not. You know, we're not Gentiles. And I just want to say that that it's possible that we can be half baked. Half baked. <laughs> we'll get to that in just a second. But first, we'll start with DNC 109 verse 60. DNC 109 was given to Joseph Smith by revelation before the dedication of the Kirtland Temple and read by John Taylor at the dedication. And in verse 60, it says, Now these words, O Lord, we have spoken before thee concerning the revelations and commandments which thou hast given to us who are identified with the Gentiles. Uh-oh. So I don't think that that means that we're not Israelite. What that means is throughout the Book of Mormon, I mean, when you have Nephi seeing the pilgrims in in chapter, I believe it's 13 and 14, um, when he sees the pilgrims, he sees the Revolutionary War, all of these people coming to America are the Gentiles. And so it's very helpful to go back to... So don't be offended that we're labeled amongst the Gentiles. Yeah, because in the Book of Mormon, we are. That's what we're referred to as the Gentiles. In Hosea chapter 7, it talks, Hosea was a prophet to the northern tribes, so he was specifically a prophet to Ephraim. And he, okay, so remember Joseph is a type. Remember that when he very first started to tell those dreams, he he kind of really offended his brother his brothers and then he told them the next dream which made it a lot worse then he the, offended his parents yeah exactly and so <laughs> so we we might consider that our typological father might have had some pride issues oh just no just maybe we don't have any pride do we <laughs> does he even have pride yeah. no yeah isaiah 28 well to the crown of pride to the drunkards of so Ephraim. I just want to jump in there a little bit and say, so when we think about us being Ephraim and we get all full of ourselves because we know that it is scripturally accurate that they have to come to us for their blessings. You, yeah, you got to not get all carried away of thinking that we're all that because Christ was very clear. He who is the greatest is the servant of all. And because we, those that are the greatest servants are the most willing to descend see before that almost gives us a type going back to the time of christ you know the pharisees were trying to do it right they thought they were all that and they didn't go over so good with pride john (laughs) and with christ (laughs) you know it is so i'm just telling you get that pharisaical attitude out of your heart just clear it up and realize our job is ephraim it's to, to serve. serve. Yeah. Never get it out of our heads that our job is to serve. And so here in Hosea chapter 7, he actually calls us a half-baked pancake. Yeah, yeah that says, that, says <laughs> that we're mushy on top. Yeah. And, we and haven't we're been not flipped. Even, we, we haven't repented. Have you ever had a and come... pancake that was mushy on top? Yeah. Or even in the middle. <laughs> not... And the reason that he were being described this way in Hosea is because of the fact that we are born amongst the nations. Ephraim was he wasn't trained up as an as a in Hebrew from the time he was a boy. And we are mixed with the ideas and the philosophies of the nations amongst Babylon. which we dwell. Which is the danger of being a Gentile. Gentile in Hebrew is Goyim and it's translated directly as nations. So a lot of us have a really bad, like, unbeliever connotation with Gentiles, and that, that isn't there in the Hebrew at all. It well, just means we're another Gentiles nation. Gentiles might not be believers, so that's not a complete Right, we kind of have that 50-50 fallout. You know? But that, I, what it really means is we just need to cook the other side. Right. Ephraim is, hath mixed himself among the people, the goyim, or the nations. Ephraim is a cake not turned. And then this one gets a little personal and prophetic to America today. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. It's kind of like our leaders. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him 
for all of this. So, yeah, the, the scriptures have quite a bit, actually, to say about Ephraim's pride. And that flipping over is going to be a pretty harsh repentance that we're going to have to come full circle with. It's going to get hot. Before we can be a servant, before we can rise. Yeah, it's going to get a little hot for us, maybe for a little while. We're going to jump right now ahead just a minute to Ephraim's patriarchal blessing when Jacob is blessing his sons and giving them their blessings in Isaiah and Genesis 48 and 49. But here in verse 19, um, we see that Jacob is going to refuse to switch his hands. Remember, he crosses and he blesses Ephraim with the blessing of the first, the firstborn, the greater blessing, and Manasseh. And Joseph tries to correct him and say, no, no, Manasseh's older. But he says, no, I've got it right. This is Ephraim's blessing. And then he tells him that Ephraim is going to be a melo of the goyim, which in your King James Version is translated as a multitude of nations. And we see that today, of course, that that um, Ephraimites are, are dispersed, spread, dispersed. But... There, another translation, melo, means full of fullness as well. It says multitude, translated multitudes there, but it also means fullness. And goyim is Gentiles as well as nations. So you could directly translate Ephraim's blessing as being Ephraim is to become the fullness of the Gentiles. That's his mission. Which, if you understand a lot of our work, you realize that the time of the Gentiles began when right the gospel after, went to yeah, the nations at right the time after of Christ, Christ when he was crucified. When he was crucified, and actually, at, at yes, um, in Pentecost, Acts chapter yeah, two, and Pentecost, yeah, where it was, yeah. it was, it's going to the Gentiles. That's when and, they were sent out to the nations. And you realize that with Joseph Smith and the Restoration. We are now in the tithing of the time of the Gentiles. It's a beautiful concept when you understand that, that we are in the time of the tithing, which, you know. So 1830 your, to coming up on 2030, that, that's 200 years from yeah. the restoration of the church. If you count from the first vision, you know, we are in, you know, and, and Moroni said to Joseph Smith in the Joseph Smith history in your Pearl of Great Price that Joseph's mission was to bring the fullness of of the Gentiles, Gentiles in that time in. And, and so we have the time of the Gentiles when the gospel went to the nations, clear from Acts chapter 2, and now we're in the fullness, the tithe, which, that 10% Which is all over the, the signs of the, of the times and, yeah, those, it's, it's, and the sign of Revelation 12. It connects in 12. so many ways, yeah, right? It's, it's the uh, change of the guard, and it's all happening. It's happening in front of your eyes. It's right. really taking place right, right here it, in our day. Now. So we have to address this first because we have to we have to be okay with the fact that Ephraim is identified as Gentile in the scriptures, he, and that he married in Egypt, right? And you have this story of Joseph, and and he's thrown into the pit, and and Reuben. Uh, plans to go back and rescue him, but he finds he's been sold. Judah suggests that he's sold to the Midianites, and and we're in the middle of this this horrible climactic story, and then all of a sudden, boom! Shiny object, squirrel. <laughs> yep. Genesis chapter thirty-eight, and you have this sordid tale of Judah and Tamar, and you just wonder. And then you know, and right there in Genesis chapter thirty-nine, we pick up with the story of Joseph again, and you're like. Why was that there? Ooh, did somebody lose this chapter? What's it doing right here? And just because it's it's telling it's actually telling the same thing. It's telling about Joseph's mission, but most people don't don't even pick up on what's going on. So we're gonna so hit I it wanna just really quick. Jump just in with a little tip of the iceberg right that I have to pass off to Chuck. Um, that Chuck when, Yeah, when you think about. The scriptures. Do you ever stop and consider that every piece is in there for a reason, or do you just think this is yes. random stories? No. What I'm saying is, it is our it. premise and belief that scripture was designed for us, and that there's no accidents. The scriptures are absolutely designed to show us everything we need to understand. All we got to do is, is figure out is why turn it's turn over. Right? <laughs> sometimes. The 
contradictions. Sometimes we have to turn over the contradictions to find the truth. I love the way Chuck puts it. If you find an apparent contradiction, look for the jewel at the resolution right. of that contradiction. All right, so we're going to see that actually the book of Ruth is connected with Genesis 38. And now you're wondering, okay, well, what does the book of Ruth have to do with the story of Joseph? Um, the book of Ruth, uh, the joyous climax occurs when Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and the hero of the narrative redeems Naomi and takes Ruth to be his Gentile bride. Did you hear that? Gentile bride? So okay, Boaz so. actually... Takes a Ruth, Gentile bride. Wow. Ruth is a picture of the of the Gentiles, and Naomi is a picture of Israel in this story. So you can see the parallel with Joseph taking a Gentile. And you're going to see it embedded right here in chapter 38. In addition to providing us with a charming romantic story, um, we quickly discover that this little tiny book of Ruth, by, by the way, that's probably my favorite love story, Ex, you know, aside from Luke 2 and well, the birth of Christ. Saying, I thought you were going to say besides ours. <laughs> oh, well, you know, that one too. But, you know, the, I got to put the story of the birth of Christ and his love for us first and put the book of Ruth second because it, it is such a... We'll, we'll get to this that in detail when we get to the book of Ruth. But what we need to understand is there's things we learn about the kinsman redeemer there and that totally explains Revelation chapter 5. There is so much embedded in your Bible here. But here when you get to the end of the book of Ruth, when you have the wedding of the kinsman redeemer and the Gentiles that have been redeemed, um, the people cry out, and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh's. And if you've read Genesis 38, you did your homework, um, yeah, that... That Pharaoh's is illegitimate. Pharaoh's is Judah's son that he had child. to his daughter-in-law Tamar um, because he was kind of trying to to thwart the posterity of Tamar. He was supposed to give his the youngest son to her after these older two sons. It's kind of the Leveret law of marriage, a, a precursor to it here. But... You know, if you were there at the wedding and someone said, you know, blessings to you, like, may your children be like Pharaoh's, you might be tempted to, <laughs> to, to kind of exclaim, if you know the story, well, same to you, fella. You know, what kind of a blessing is that to end the whole book of Ruth? With? So, so maybe I'm jumping the gun. I hope not. But, but this whole concept of, of a mistake, aren't we all kind of there? Well, we all are kind we of, not all kind of illegitimate in the sense that we're full of sin? And yeah, that's what I say. In know, essence, we all need. It's it's kind of identifying with the Gentiles. Yeah, we all need. It's a little, a little bit, bit of a here. little bit of a pride poke. But the truth of it is, we all need but, the Lord. We all need the. But Savior. historically, you know, Judah's sons kind of are zeros in the Bible, and it's Perez <laughs> that's going to be the the faithful. The faithful yeah. one. So you actually have the son that's... The and of course he's a twin, right? With yeah. The other. It's a lot so. of twins. I know. And, and get this, get this. Watch this. We'll do the next slide right here. Tamar gives birth to two sons, Zareph and Pharaoh's. And both are, of course, illegitimate. Okay? And the Torah instructs us that a bastard son has to be cast out until the 10th generation. Now, this is hugely important because, you know, it says the same thing about Moabites. And guess what Ruth is? Ruth is a Moabite. Ruth is a Moabite. And so, so in we're essence, starting to pick up on this yeah. Gentile taint here prophetically in the story of Tamar. And it says that the strange... A remark in Ruth where they are t telling her that they hope that her posterity is a blessing is actually a prophecy. Because what you're going to see, and you can read it in, in verses 18 to 22, that Perez is going to be the father of Hezron and then Ram, and we're going to go down. This is actually the lineage of Boaz, and in the 10th generation, we're going to see King David. Now, for Genesis 38, 
and what is this chapter doing in here with all these Gentiles and these and these people being kind of redeemed in the tenth generation. Remember, Noah is the tenth generation from Adam. And Abraham is the tenth generation from Noah. So you're going to start to pick up on these things in the Bible. But what we wanted to show you is that here, and we got this from Chuck Misler, um, here, he, one of our favorite Bible scholars, he happened to cross in an Israelite library a document showing that the names Boaz and Ruth are embedded in the Hebrew letters of Genesis chapter 38. Counting every 49th letter, you'll get like the B, and then the 49 letters, you'll get the O. It's amazing how you, that kind of comes out sometimes. Right, and these kind of Bible codes are called equidistant letter sequencing, and there's pros and cons on it and everything, but I I just have to show you this one because this one it's is, is going to blow your mind. Yeah, it's almost too much to be coincidence. Yeah, it's and so what is Boaz and Ruth doing in this sordid tale of Judah and Tamar? Well, moving on in the chapter, the next thing we find, Obed. The, the name Obed in the 49 equidistant letter sequence. Moving on a few verses later, we find Ishe, Jesse in Hebrew in 49 letter increments and then finally david now you know you could say well who is the type of yeah Davidic and so here we have david who will go and slay the giant we have david who will free israel we have this redemption in the 10th generation so just summation we're taking illegitimacy and making it legitimate yes <laughs> wow. or a gentile like, and making them and boaz being Israel. a type of the savior and Lord boaz Lord. is the redeemer that is going to father this whole plan this whole process that somehow through giving his laws and commandments and and even through our failures to keep those laws and commandments god's got a plan that's going to increase. It's going to save more and more people. And it's buried right there in the text in Genesis 38. And again, these kinds of things, oh, by the way, Chuck Miller says that if, if you want to do the math on the probability of this, not only are these names Boaz, and Ruth and Obed and, and Ishay and David, not only are they all embedded in this chapter, they are embedded in order. In chronological order. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got to get your head wrapped around this, okay? We're talking Genesis here. It's we are of, not in Judges. We are not in for Samuel. Like Samuel numbers. has the not picked David yet. <laughs> okay? So the question is how could Moses do that? Or the question is, did Moses do that? Obviously, we know the answer to that equation. Holy cow. It's above our skill set. Yeah. Well, you know? I, it is beyond even the time Moses couldn't have, couldn't you have know possibly what? known. Now you've just tripped on my new thing about pictorial Hebrew. I just am so fascinated with the power which I believe is right next to the Adamic tongue. Yeah. The pictorial Hebrew, the power. Well, and the it's Spirit just... of God revealing these things and encoding things there. If you don't think there are secrets in in the text of the scriptures, the, the rabbis actually believe that there's not only meaning in the words, but there's meaning in the letters. And there's not only meaning in the letters, but there is meaning in the spaces between the letters. Well, just, just the fact that there are words. I mean, if you watched our first session... Of Bereshit. Of what's in Bereshit. Yeah, yeah, just the, in all the, the dynamics in that first right. word. You realize that every part of the word and the completion of the word are all one story. So one of the things that you notice in, in this particular equidistant letter sequencing that, that's in Genesis 38 is that it's written the way we read 
from left to right. So the the no, the letters are actually coming backwards, spelling out their names backwards in Hebrew. And just a, a, a side note is that when the equidistant lettering sequence is backwards, it means that someone's trying to thwart God's plan. So Jude, there, there's more to this than Judah is trying to thwart a lineage that God has ordained here. And so this whole Gentiles becoming Israelite and becoming converted and being pro- the progenitors of, of Boaz and David is, is so beautiful here because that's part of Ephraim's mission is to increase it and to turn it around in the end time. These kinds of hidden treasures that are in the scriptures are placed there. I don't think anybody could have, in foresight, seen that. We have to know the story of Boaz and Ruth and David and Obed and Jesse. We have to read about it before we can go back and find their names. Well, another plug for one of our videos, the backstory. You have to know yeah. the backstory. You have to get, yeah. I mean, the whole concept of the backstory. In order to start seeing all these prophecies. And that's you kind think of what, you understand the story behind the story. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're giving you a little backstory here so that you're going to be able to see what the baker and the butler's dreams. We, we are going to get there. It's okay. Breathe. Okay. Go, go, gadget. Wow, God. You know, we, we just look backward and we just see the majesty of God. And this brings me to, you know, I, this is actually from the Star of Bethlehem, but this is this is one of my favorite verses in Proverbs where it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out the matter. Back to those jewels and those treasures yes. that are, are hidden there in the scriptures. And all of them point to Christ. All right, so back to Hosea where um, he's not too complimentary of Ephraim in in the last days. He says in chapter 6, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. And of course, that is a quote from Isaiah chapter 19, which is all about Egypt, which is all about America, which is all about us. Okay? So it's talking to us. And then he says, After two days, remember, time of the Gentiles has been about 2,000 years since the gospel went to the nations in Acts chapter 2. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. The true changing of the guard. This millennial doorstep that we're about, the threshold that we're coming up on in just a few short years. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, that His going forth, meaning the coming of Christ, is as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain. Now, that's kind of backwards of what we would think. The early rains are the ones in the fall in Israel. The latter rains are the ones in the spring. When did Jesus come symbolically? He came in the spring feast in Passover at his first coming. Interesting enough, in the last, here in the end, Adam on down is in the spring first, and then anyway. right. But here, his second coming is going to be represented in the fall feast when he descends on the Mount of Olives on the Day of Atonement, and we have the Feast of Tabernacles. All of these imageries, his second coming is represented in the fall feast, and so remember that Adam on Diamond. Pentecost, it's still kind of connected. The rabbis say it's still part of the spring feasts, actually. It's not connected to the fall feast. But we are going to watch Jesus connect it to the fall feast in just a second. Because we're learning all these codes. Oh, I missed that other part. The part that was, uh, oh, well, Ephraim. The <laughs> the <laughs> Why Ephraim would bad, you repent? Your, your, your righteousness is, is as the morning dew. As the morning dew, yeah. Yeah, meaning right. we forget so quickly. So again, if if you're familiar with our stuff on like the backstory, you're, you're familiar with this way we kind of divide up time. We have the time from Moses when he received the law of God and he received the prophetically appointed times in Leviticus 23 in the Torah, in the law of God at Mount Sinai. Um, when he received those commandments, 
all the way till the time of Christ. That was about 1,500 years. So Mount Sinai, just ballparking it, okay? We don't want to argue over dates here, but it was 14 da 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 BC. Is what? I know you have an opinion on this. Okay. (laughs) No time for that. Right. Not not today. (laughs) But we're going to ballpark that as about 1,500 years since Mount Sinai to the to the time of Christ. And then, of course, we've just mentioning that in Acts chapter two, after the tongues of fire, and we're gonna we're gonna have three thousand people believe in Christ and and recognize what they just saw enacted in front of them, that it was a fulfillment of the prophetic appointed times of Passover, that they watched it. And you're going to have a huge conversion so much that we call this the beginning of the church age. This is the, this is the beginning of Christianity and the belief in Christ. But don't forget that all of those 12 apostles are Jews and that everybody that's converted there was coming to the pilgrimage feast of, of Pentecost there of Shavuot so they, they were, were observing. all they were observing Jewish law and so we have to understand that's why we call it the changing of the guard it was the Jews that converted the first Christians they were the first so converted essence, Christians it was and the, the gospel Jews that went brought it to the Gentiles yeah the gospel went from the Jews to the Gentiles and right it's there. our job to bring it to the and greater house change, of Israel. The, yes, in the end time right here, it's going to be the Gentile's job to take it back to the house of Israel. Yeah, I use... To bring Christ to I them. I use a different wording just because I like it better. Instead of back, to bring it to the greater house of Israel. Right, right. Because yeah. it and in the end time, it's the three branches of the house of Israel, which we'll get to in Isaiah. There's the, Israel is the Jews... The Lamanites, the descendants of right. Lehi, and, and the ten tribes. And we probably shouldn't take the time, but in essence, when most of us read the story that that the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah should be, we forget that branch the, three, the branch three, the tribes that, the that are tribes. right there in Ezekiel. That's right. So we, we yeah. always remember. You know, the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah. But, the other tribes, it But says, the other right? tribes, which is the ten tribes, we always seem to read over that in that prophetic picture. All right. So, and then, the, of course, the purple is <clears throat> the end. This is the millennial day. This is the last thousand years. And it is symbolized in the agriculture of Israel and in the festivals that were that were the prophetic times. It's the final harvest. It's yeah. the fi- this is the grape harvest. Okay, right. that's why it's purple. And then the 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 summertime harvest, the one that's symbolized by Pentecost or Shavuot, is it because it's summertime. We kind of picked a summer color, orange. So you're gonna always. See, well, it is the wheat harvest. Yeah, we are the wheat. And the wheat and and the wheat and the tares. That's us, you know. And and all of those parables in Matthew 13 that are all about the time of the Gentiles. There's they're mixing. It's the the nations mixing with Israel, and then in the millennial day where Israel is going to be reborn. Okay, so you can see that color coding going on there, and you can see there that the offering that was brought to the temple representing this time of the Gentile is two big, huge loaves loaves of wheat bread that are leavened. You've got that mixing. And it all starts. Oh, and what does leaven do? It pride. Yeah. In the scriptures, leaven is always a symbol of but sin. But it tastes so and, good. And I no. know, right? <laughs> ah. But it, we're, we're dealing again with another symbol of the pride of Ephraim. So again, this is the birth of the church, and that there are it's going to be represented in scripture this time period as two days. And we're going to take a look at some of those in just a second. Now, in Luke 24, this, this is going to set the whole stage for the whole thing. It says that it w- the reason Christ suffered... The whole reason, and that he rose from the dead on the third day, the whole reason for this was that repentance could be preached among the nations. So we, 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 in our hindsight, we often don't realize that it was forbidden before the atonement of Christ 
As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus tells the, the apostles, don't go out, don't, his disciples don't go out and preach to the nations. We have, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't take it to the Gentiles yet. And then we have the Grand Commission in the end of the New Testament where now go take it to the nation. That's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees had such a hard time with this. Yeah. They're, they're like, like the... you can't invite them into the gospel. They will. Oh, my gosh. That's the book of Ruth. That's the near kinsman who said, um, I won't marry Ruth. She'll contaminate. Contaminate. Me. Yeah. yeah, me. And again, this is a picture of the fact that the Israelites at that time, at the time of Christ, were not ready or willing to make the sacrifices that would be necessary to bring in the Gentile nations when Jesus said it was time. And we have to, we have to ask ourselves, in our day, will the Ephraimites be willing to humble their pride and give the gospel back to them and be numbered with them like it says in the book of mormon because there's like secret combinations going on with the gentiles and you know it's going to be bad for the gentiles that don't get numbered with them in so the i'm end. excited let's yeah, go let's go okay so he tells them to wait until that they are endowed with power so he jesus ascended on the 40th day and then he tells them to wait until they are endowed with power. What's 10 days after Jesus' ascension? Pentecost. Pentecost. Okay. So they wait for 10 days. And then in the words of the prophet Joseph Smith, it says that they were endowed in the upper room on Pentecost. So they wait till Pentecost. And there they will have the tongues of fire that are poured out. And they, you will have the conversion and the birth of the church of Pentecost. And just understand that that is the center time of all of the seven prophetically appointed times. This time in the Gentiles is like the peak. It's like the chiastic center. You have the first coming of Christ in the spring feasts and the green ones. You have the second coming of Christ in the it's purple like ones. Their job was to save us and our job is to save them. Yeah, like that. And now we're talking the whole type of the life of Joseph of Egypt, our father. All right, so the Feast of Shavuot, another really cool thing that a lot of people don't know is that this was the an anniversary. At Pentecost, this was the anniversary of the receiving of the commandments on Mount Sinai. It was also Pentecost or Shavuot. Pentecost is just the Greek way of saying Shavuot. Shavuot means sevens. They count seven sevens to get to this day. Remember, Jesus ascended on the 40th day and they waited 10 more days. It's the day after seven sevens. So in Hebrew, they say Shavuot. Oat means plural, means lots of sevens. Seven sevens, and then we get to the day after. That's the 50th day. But in Greek, Pente. Is five. Is five. And so we have Pentecost, meaning the 50th day. It's the same thing. And it is the anniversary of the law. But when the law was given, you remember that they had been worshiping the golden calf? How many people died when the law was given? 3,000. It was 3,000. And yet on Pentecost, when the Spirit of God is poured out, when the atonement of Christ is now in place, the 3,000 live all right, so here you're going to start to see what we've been telling you. These two days that Hosea talked about and the third day. You've got an exodus right there at Mount Sinai. He says, get ready today and tomorrow. How many days is that? Two. And then on the third day, look how many times he says, on, be ready, be prepared for the third day. Okay, because on the third day, they're going to meet with God. Are you picking up on the prophetic imagery of this? That after the time of Gentiles in this millennial day, we'll meet with God. Now, John chapter 4, and you do a whole video on, on every word in John chapter 4 is a prophecy. But we're going to just pick up on one verse when he is telling the disciples that after, after the woman at the well has gotten everybody to come and they're believing on Christ, he says... Say not ye that there are four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white, all ready to harvest. 
And so in our Western thinking, we, have not, we haven't got a clue what he's talking about there. But I put these pictures up here. These, there's a picture of some Samaritans. Actually, this is a recent picture of Samaritans that are observing the prophetic appointed times. And on Shavuot, they are dressed in white. And here you see some children in Jerusalem observing Shavuot today. You notice they are dressed in white because they dress in white on Shavuot. And it's a symbol of fruitfulness and flowers and, and the gospel be going out. But it says that, look on the fields and now imagine all of those people that the, the woman at the well has, has told. They're coming across those fields and they're all white because it's Shavuot. And Jesus is saying, look on the fields. These Samaritans, they are like mixed bloods. The Jews don't like them because they are Half-baked. Gentiles. Mm -hmm. Okay? And Jesus is saying, hey, no, the time of the Gentiles is, is now, even now. And so here is a little bit of a chart on the feast. What you can see is that between Shavuot and trumpets is four months. That's what Jesus was talking about. You think it's you think we have to wait till you know until the fall harvest? No, the Gentiles are ready to harvest even now. It's beautiful. So, also we're going to see the the two days in these same conversations that we're having in John chapter four. Jesus is going to say that he stays with the Samaritans or the Gentiles. How long? Two days. Yeah, because you did the video on it. <laughs> right. And and there's also so many other prophecies in in the, in John chapter four. It's in case so you missed it, a day unto the Lord is a thousand years. Right. Second Peter, chapter three, verse eight. Okay, a, that that a day is a thousand years. So we're talking the two thousand year time of the Gentiles. And look, he says it again. Now after two days, uh oh. Now this after two days he what? He departed. departed. So the time of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. It's going to be over and he will depart. And the the But when he departs he goes somewhere else. Yes, he does. And it says that in Luke and we're gonna go there. Oops, nope, we're gonna first show you that there are seven thousand years in the history of the earth, right? And so what day is the millennial day? Well we're gonna start with Mount Sinai. And we're going to catch that first 1,500 years, the, the time of Israel and the law, okay? Then you're going to have the coming of Christ. You know, you could almost talk about that as, as being from Moses, and you could actually go from there, but right. not Moses. I'm sorry, from Abraham. That's what I meant to say. It's from Abraham. Oh, like from Abraham. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The Israel. That's what Israel. I said, the patriarchs yeah. of Israel, right? So you have that 1500 period there of year period of Israel. And then you have when the gospel went to the nations, right? And so there's 1,000 years, 2,000 years. We're almost to the end of the second thousand years. But the third day from Christ and the seventh day in the history of the earth are the same day. In the scriptures, this is the millennial day of the Lord. And what we wanted you to see is that depending if you're counting from the New Testament or from the Old Testament, the seventh day and the third day in scripture are millennial. And we could show you tons of scriptures on that, but we're only going to have time to pick out just a cherry pick. Just a couple of them, because there's so much there. Yeah, even that. But just in the tabernacle in the wilderness, if you take the square footage of the the uh, the cloth wall, it was five cubits high. On on the long side, it was a hundred cubits, and on the short side, it was fifty cubits. Add all that up, we've got three hundred cubits times five cubits high, and we've got one thousand five hundred square cubits. When the law was established, when the fence was put up, that is Israel. That is the time of Israel. Now, the next place that you'll enter if you go through the courtyard is going to be the holy place. Now, the holy place is 20 cubits long. And I can't remember what is it. 10, by ten, 10. 10 cubits wide, right? And 10 high. And ten high. 
Now, because we're ascending, we're progressing as we go higher and higher through the temple symbolically, we are going to go from square cubits to cubic cubics. Did I what say that? that right? I don't know. That was, <laughs> don't ask <laughs> me to fix it. Say. No. <laughs> but, and in the holy place, there are 2,000 cubic cubits. So we have the time of Israel as the law and the, and the border, and then we have the time of the Gentiles. But then you go through the veil into the holy of holies, and there... Your cubic dimensions are one thousand cubic cubic. So day. the actual the actual layout of the tabernacle is a timeline. It's also a map, but that's in a whole you other know, presentation. I don't know if other people appreciate this, but this is really it's good so for you. It's so exciting for me. We we get into this stuff where it's just oh, it's the, the majesty of God. Yeah. On every detail and every level, it's amazing when you think about it. Right. All right, and so and this is what I said. This is kind of the sad part that you kind of mentioned, is that in Luke chapter nine, Jesus is going to go back to Samaria, and it says that he sends his servants, he sends his disciples ahead of him, and they absolutely reject them. The second so time. it kind of gets kind of scary That's, for the Gentiles yes. at the end. Yeah, so you have to realize that in the end time, your Gentiles kind of split in half. There's those, like in the book of Ruth, there are those that, like Orpah, her daughter-in-law that went back to her gods. And then there's Ruth, who will say, your God is my God, and I'm not going anywhere, even if I die with you. Okay? So, um... It's just right there in Scripture, symbolically, that they don't receive Jesus the next time he comes through. And notice right there it says, and they went to another village. So this is the gospel again being taken from the Gentiles. So this is the this short time. version of the woman at the well. Yeah, very short version. There's so much more. But again, we need to hurry. We're just trying to show you that this is everywhere in Scripture once you see it. Okay? And then... In 1 Nephi 13, we have that famous scripture that says that the gospel first went to the Jews, Israel, and then to the Gentiles, right? But that in the end time, it comes from the Gentiles back to the greater house of Israel, represented there by the Jews. And then, watch this, so the last... Because the Jews got it first and then the Gentiles were last. The last in the end time is first. Right. And the first, anciently, will be last. And that is again another reference to these time periods. Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, watch the third day. That third day is all over scripture. Remember that it can be day one, two, three, but it also means on a grand prophetic scale, in the millennial day, that he rose again. Joseph Smith said, The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and the prophets concerning Jesus Christ that he died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day and ascended up into heaven. So, of course, he's quoting Paul there, but all other things are only appendages to these, okay, I'm which pertain to, to our religion. Rabbit trail for a real quick okay. second. The third day, he rose again. Go to whose Sabbath is Sabbath. And yes. Truly understand. Oh my gosh! The last he was week of raised Christ. on the he third day. Did a day, video on that one too. Not yes. on the second. On the third day. Yeah. All right. So, what's the first miracle that Jesus performs? The wedding of Cana. On the third day. So this is a type of this marriage supper of the Lamb. Again, we're typing that millennial day, the wedding. Of the Lamb when He comes. So this third day is like really 
in the scriptures everywhere. When you we see actually it. have a whole a whole presentation of like tons of slides on the third day in scriptures. I'm ah. We, we can't do all of them. I mean, guys, we do too the much already. <laughs> warriors stand on the third day. And the, you know, there's oh, so much. But here, check check this one out because we've, we've done Genesis 22 recently. What day is it when Abraham lifts his eyes to Mount Moriah and the offering of the sun? The third day. It's the third day. Okay. And then notice that it's always in the morning. The stripling warriors, too, on the third day in the morning. These are the celestial. These are the elect. These are the first resurrections that come forth. Right. You saw those resurrection motifs in there, too. Rise up, rise up, yeah. rose up, everywhere. All right. So in the scriptures, the third day is going to be in the butler and the baker's dream. We're about to get there. You, you made it through all the pavement and the groundwork. Um, it's so fascinating that in the law of Moses, if you're sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer on the third day, get this, it actually says this. If you're sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer on the third day, you'll be clean in the seventh day. Like it's the same day or something, right? <laughs> and people the thought day. Moses was nuts. <laughs> he wasn't. He knew exactly, the, well, the Lord <laughs> the third knew day. exactly what he was talking about, okay? <laughs> Esther obtains the favor of the king. Queen Esther, the Israelite. Um, King Solomon, two, two women. One of them fails, and the other one is blessed. So, scripturally speaking, there's that that Orpa part of the Gentiles, the the, the daughter that goes back to the part her that didn't idols. get baked on the other side, or, or in the parable of the ten virgins, the five foolish virgins that right. don't stay true, and the five wise ones that do. You have one woman fails, and one woman is blessed. Stripling warriors. They stand in the morning of the third day, and then King Hezekiah is healed on the third day. There's so many of them. This is just, just yeah, a few. Yeah, it's just, it's all over when you see But it. now you're ready. Now you're ready to read the dream of the butler and the baker. And Joseph said unto them, this is a clue, do not interpretations belong to God. That is absolutely so, oh my gosh, now we're going to get into the levels of prophecy in these dreams. And the chief butler, now remember, butler is a grape harvest, and the grape harvest is when the gospel is the restoration of Israel, right? So the grape harvest is, is restored Israel, which includes all the Gentiles that got numbered with them. The five wise virgins and 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 in the parables in in Matthew 13, it's going to be the fish that don't get thrown back; they they get kept. You know, these are the this is the Gentile harvest. This is the wheat, not the tares, right? Okay. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, "In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. So how many branches are there in the house of Israel? I'm going to actually show it to you in Zenos' allegory in just a second, really, really quickly. But this is the restoration of the house of Israel. This is the three branches of Israel. And it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. Now Pharaoh, in the dream, is we, the king. Yeah, we're going to go there. Where he, Pharaoh the, the, actually is Pharaoh reigns in the millennial Supreme. day, the king of kings. And so he's going to actually and this be is, a, a reference to Christ. Yeah, he's a rep, he's figuratively. Yes. The one with the power. The king. All right. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes. Now this is, you know, Ephraim has to be willing to lay the sheaf to be laid down before it rises in order to humble himself and, and fulfill his mission. But notice here what Israel's mission is. It says, and I took the grapes and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. What cup did Jesus drink? What is going to happen to those believers in Israel will they stand in the end time yeah, when you when you read in Daniel 12 that it's a time of trouble like unto no other for Israel um, time for Jacob's trouble it's it's humbling and they're gonna stand to think what just like go those through. that humble their hearts of Ephraim are gonna stand they're gonna stand in Jerusalem as well and I just pounded the table mm -hmm. <laughs> and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. 
So that's the offering that they gave the Lord. Now, this is just a really quick old seminary handout that they used to hand out um, for when you studied Jacob chapter 5 in the Book of Mormon, Zenos' allegory. And you can see here in the picture that they've got four branches. You've they, color-coded it. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they didn't color code it. You color coded it to match it. <laughs> I was doing the time for Yeah, okay. So um, I go crazy with my colors. But anyway, you can see that the branches that he talks about, these branches that he's going to go and take and, and scatter and spread abroad, that he's there. He, he mentions what sounds like four, but in reality, there's only three. Because the fourth one that they have pictured here for is just referring back to the one that was mentioned before you actually, know that because i actually always read it that way so. yeah there, there's they don't ever mention uh, that other branch again so it was it was actually referring to the third branch there's three branches here and there's two other verses in 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 Zenus's allegory that actually call out the three branches not four so the the point is that in the allegory here you can see that there are three branches even in that allegory, and we already mentioned Ezekiel, where there's three branches, and it's it's all over. It's in the law. It's, it's in everywhere. Isaiah 19 as well. In the the harvest agricultural prophetic feasts that that we pay so much attention to prophetically, the harvest in the springtime at the first coming of Christ was the barley harvest, the harvest of the Gentile time. The one that was brought to the temple at that time was a wheat harvest. That's why we have all this these verses about the wheat and the tares and stuff in this time of the Gentiles period. And of course, we've already mentioned that at this whole restoration, when Israel believes that Jesus is the Christ, then the grapes are going to be offered at that time. And we already saw that those grapes were pressed in, in the Pharaoh's cup. But the thing that I wanted us to... So- Maybe you're going there, but I, I just wanted to point out that so the feral, you know, I used to get teased about that. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Anyway, the the feral actually is the one who restores the butler, um, and so that is figurative to what we're talking about. That the three branches are restored by power by the authority the of yes. yeah of yes. the feral. All right. All right. Now let's go ahead and finish reading what Joseph tells him about his dream. He says, the three branches are three days, those same three days, third days that we've been reading all through scriptures. Yet within three days, the Pharaoh, Pharaoh will lift up thy head and he will restore thee. That's Hosea. That place. Yeah. That's all over the Book of Mormon. The yeah, that's, of the it's, house yeah of we're talking. It's just like Which in Hosea. Joseph Smith the third day. laid the foundation for and started it. And it's figurative to Christ being risen on yeah. the third day. All this, the third day thing is very. Oh simple. gosh, it's even in the Doctrine and Covenants when it talks about the fig tree and it says, you know, that you the the gospel has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith, so that when the summer is ended. Your souls will be saved. Actually, kind of says it in the inverse. It says that that when the summer is ended, your souls that your Hope souls that you're not that the ones yeah. that won't be saved. Yeah, we you got to oh. repent so that you will be saved before the summer is ended. Right. In there, I think that's your DNC, souls not saved. It's either if you DNC forty five or thirty five. But anyway, and Joseph said unto him, the three branches are three days, and within the three days Pharaoh will lift up thy head and restore thee to thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand, and after the former manner, when thou wast his butler in the beginning, before. All right, now the baker. The baker says, wow, that was nice. I like your interpretation. I want, I tell, let me tell What's you mine? my dream. Okay. Now, remember that the baker, what are the two things that are offered during Shavuot? When it's the wheat harvest, what is, what is being offered in the two temple? Loads. The two great, big, huge loaves of wheat bread that's leavened, right? Okay, so when the baker saw that his interpretation was good, he said, I had a dream, and I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of bake meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket that was on my head. Now, in order to, to, to get this one, we've got those three images that we need to take a real quick look at. The baskets, 
the baked meats, and the birds. BBB baskets, base, baked meats, and birds. Okay, this is an actual picture of a, a Shavuot offering at this being reenacted in Jerusalem in 2014. And you can see these two huge loaves of wheat bread. They're, they're actually baked in the shape of an altar. Go figure that symbolically. What is Ephraim's mission? The two loaves that are willing. Do you know that like Joseph of Egypt, the more willing you are to suffer without a bad attitude, without blaming God, trusting Him, that no matter if you get falsely accused and thrown into prison for 14 years, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade and you trust God anyway. That no, the greater the <clears throat> descent, the greater the willingness of an innocent person to sacrifice for others, the greater the, more, the number of people well, I was gonna say, he the can more save power and bless. They have. Yeah. Absolutely. You look at what Joseph is going to do. Joseph of Egypt, he's going to save nations and all of Israel. It's powerful. All right. So here, um, I, just as a really quick reference to Deuteronomy to let you know that when they brought the first fruits of the land, including the wheat harvest, that they would put it in a basket. It's a commandment in Deuteronomy. So these baskets, he's got three baskets, and these are representative of what his offering is to the Lord, the baker. Here you can see a, a basket in the reenactment, and here they're bringing the fruits of the land during Shavuot, or Pentecost. If you look up in Blue Letter Bible and look at the word in, in, um, in Hebrew that's translated as the bake meats that are in the baskets, it says that they are, gosh, it's too little, I can't Deeds, it, things it done, acts, work, labor. Works and so these are your works. This is this is not just what you say because you know that's a classic Gentile thing in the end time. You've got even Jesus gives a parable about that. He says, "Who is better, the one that says that he won't and then does, does or the one that says that he will and doesn't and then doesn't?" Okay, so what's going to happen to all these things that the baker is saying? professing that he will do um, that is represented by the baked meats that are in the baskets and then remember that the birds eat them well that's not his fault right I mean birds well you have to go back to what birds are in the parables um, right really quickly before we leave this screen this is just one of many many scriptures I pulled out where Mormon is saying you unbelieving turn that you may be found spotless pure and white so the baskets are the gospel that was given to the Gentiles but what do they do with it what's going on with the baked meats in those baskets remember in the parable of the sower the fowls come the birds come and are these good birds or bad birds we always think birds you know doves holy spirit no like these ones are the bad guys the black crows you know? right okay it says and the fowls came and devoured up their seed now notice devoured notice eat up because in scripture that usually means that the the gentile nations that are idolatrous or heathen they will take over a nation or a country they will devour it okay and i mean squirrel but you know in in esdras in second esdras and on the eagle and the feathers everybody's been hearing so much about the third and the fourth feather which is going to be the president after Biden and, and the one after that, the third and the fourth president that are on that side of the eagle, it says that they are eaten up by the world order big head that wakes up in the middle. Yeah. So there's a little bit of prophecy there about Gentiles being devoured. Okay, and then notice <coughs> that, that these are the wicked one. And, and instead of all that imagery of like being caught up and lifted up, now we're being caught away, okay, by the wayside. 
So these birds are the wicked one. And, and because of the secret combinations and the influences and everything of the Gentiles, here all of their good works that they profess are being eaten up. Okay? And then Joseph tells him that the three baskets are three days. And yet within three days the Pharaoh will lift up thy head from off thee and will hang thee on a tree, which is a covenant curse for breaking a covenant. And the birds so there's your, there's shall your eat thy flesh. I get. We gotta be on one side or the other. We gotta either yeah. be on the change in the guard side where we bless Israel and become one Israel, if you want to put it that way. In the end time, become the, saints. Yes, true saints. right. Because in the um, scriptures, it stops saying Gentiles. At that point in time, they're not saints. called Gentiles anymore. The people are called saints. Yeah. Well. So we've got to be on that team, or else we're on this team. And I, I, I choose out. I'll, I'll take out of this side of the coin. Okay. So. All righty. And it came to pass that the third day was Pharaoh's birthday. And this is, of course, representing this millennial day when he is reigning as king. And he made a feast. What feast would that be? The Feast of Tabernacles, the Wedding Supper of the Lamb. He made a feast. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and the head of the chief baker amongst all of his servants. Now we're having a sheep and goat type judgment going on right here. And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again and gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And he hanged the chief baker as Joseph interpreted the dream to them. And now at this point, I'm gonna, I wanna t toss this right back to you because we're gonna go back and remember that Joseph said to the butler, he said, when things are well with thee, show kindness, I pray thee, and make mention of me to Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house of captivity. Of captivity yeah. So this, you know, gosh, this leads you to, to maybe think that at some time, you know, the Gentiles are, gonna, are bringing that gospel back to them, but they're going to stand right with them and deliver them out of captivity. I think that goes right into what you wanted to yeah, say about so Pharaoh, right? I just, for fun, I just evaluated Pharaoh in the pictorial Hebrew. Pay resh in hay. And, you know, you can just evaluate that word that is paro, um, you know, in, in the Hebrew. But it's the mouth of authority knowingly and revealing. It's so Pharaoh is actually... In the role in Scripture that it's playing, it is a type of God. Of a righteous leader. Yeah, in this instance. When he's not rebelling yeah, against Yeah, in this <laughs> instance, this Pharaoh um, is executing judgment. It's a king. It's the mouth of the kingdom. So I just wanted to show that it's, it's literally in this context, being the king, the mouth of the kingdom, it's not necessarily a bad thing is all I'm right. trying to say. Right. In this instance, it's actually figuratively representing God's well, that's judgment. that's cool because I didn't know that and that just plays right along with the interpretation of the baker and the public Yeah, stream. so in this instance, the, you know, the Pharaoh of Egypt in Moses' day gets to be a bad connotation. because yeah, he But in this day, God. he actually restores Israel. Right. You know, figuratively. Right. Figuratively, he's restoring Israel. He's, he's doing that sheep and goat judgment. He's meeting out the judgment. Welcome to Millennial Day, the yeah, return of Day. justice. So, in this righteousness. instance, don't think of the Pharaoh in a bad context. This is actually figuratively placing him in, a, in a, another context. His dream, where first we have, and it came to pass at the end of two full years. That's really fascinating in and of itself. We got the same type and shadow running. Right there, two full right years old. The Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well favored keen. And kind. kind, I'm sorry, kind and fetish, fetish, and they fed in the meadow. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, you're laughing at me. That's okay. Well, you can't ah. say it, and I and uh. I can't read it because. <laughs> <it's your laughs> <Yeah. laughs> anyway, and behold, seven other keen came up after them out of the river, and oh, I got it. It's fat fleshed. Fat fleshed, got okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And behold, seven other... Boy, we're off on a tangent. Um, <laughs> and behold, seven other kind came up after the, out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the banks of the river. 
And the ill-favored and lean fetish king did eat the seven well-favored and fat kinds, so Pharaoh awoke. So he's troubled by this. Then we have phase two. And he slept and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up on one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted at the east wind and sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And the Pharaoh told them his dream. And there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So <clears throat> we have this type and shadow going on of the of the dream of the Pharaoh, which is seven lean years consuming for seven fat years. Now, this one's a little more somber in its nature because when you go to Daniel's Hour of Judgment chart that we have, you know, I, I want to be very clear that Daniel's numbers are very mathematically proven. But a lot of the ingredients around Daniel's numbers that we this, talk about that we talk about are extrapolations. Are, are a best extrapolation to what's happening. So I've been in the state of mind when we've set this whole thing up that I believe we are yet still barely in the fat years. We have just a little time yet to prepare. When we look at the signs in the heavens, we got the two eclipses. We got the eclipse in 2017 and then the one in 24. I believe that's a, a parenthesis around America's last warning. I actually believe that it's really real that God has given us this X over the country that centers in the heart of America as a warning. And, and time is almost up. And I, I don't want to be too somber at the same time because at the same time as we go through the time of Jacob's trouble as spoken of in scriptures that is a type and a shadow of of not only Rachel and Leah's you know, Jacob's time of seven trouble for, for seven, years, seven years. But for Leah, yeah. in this instance it's Joseph or the Pharaoh's dream that we have seven years of plenty it, it, followed by seven years of lean. That we're almost on the doorstep of that seven years of lean. Because of the warning and the eclipses. Yeah, because of the eclipses and the, signs and the, and the warning. Heavens, seven years. And I, I don't like to be too sober, but at the same time, it's very real. So when we compare seven years of fat and then the seven years of lean, I am afraid, afraid, maybe it's the wrong word. I am aware that, that our time of preparation is almost done. We are now staging up to... To the wrap-up scenes. I mean, things are going to move rapidly into the wrap-up scenes at this point. Now, we shouldn't be afraid, but we should be wise. This, well, we should be like Joseph and prepare. Yeah, we should prepare. And the seven years to prepare, we have probably less than two years um, to be ready. And you can look at ready in a lot of mentality you know and a lot the most of different important ways. thing is to be ready in our yeah, hearts the most to, important to, is to be humble and, and i i doubt that we're going to be able to be absolutely ready there how do you do that i mean there there's no way it's mostly ready in faith that's what we need to be but in these times i have to hit a a very spiritual thing that happened to me in the last two to three weeks I was studying and I was praying and the Lord came upon my heart so strong. And he said unto me, it's time to step up your game, Pharaoh. It's, it's time to take it to the next level. And that's not temporally, that was speaking spiritually. Oh, absolutely spiritually. And... And I don't have time to tell this story, but I just wanted to convey to you that I had an experience while we were in Hawaii where a young girl had been crushed underneath the trailer. And and I heard Rhonda screaming because she was there and that, that it just got ran over. And I went up and kneeled next to this child. And my heart was so broken to see this young girl. And the Spirit moved upon me and said, 
If you have the faith, you could call her back and set an example for these people because we're amongst a Christian crowd who would not accept our boy of life very well. And I felt that spirit so strong, and yet my own lack of faith and my own fear was, well, if I try to use that level of priesthood and fail, what example would I be setting? Well, in our day, we know that we have to get back to that same level of priesthood and faith that Enoch had to turn rivers and to do the things he did to protect the city of Enoch. And the Lord basically put it upon my heart that that's where I got to get back to. Because in that instance, I did not call her back because I felt I was unqualified. And what he was telling me is, you got to get to the point where when you feel the promptings of the Spirit, you're not looking at your own lack of faith. You're doing it in his, in his name and in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and we are in tune enough that we can do the things we need to do to bring about these end times. I just want to back up that idea that that we have to become more righteous in that way. In um, 3 Nephi chapter 8, where it says, And now it came to pass that according yes. to our record, and we it. know that our record to be true, for behold, it was a just man who did keep the record, for he truly did many miracles in the name of Jesus. And there was not any man who could do a miracle in the name of Jesus, save he were cleansed every whit from his, his iniquity. iniquity. You know, you talk about you have my back. That's yeah. the scripture I was thinking. <laughs> okay, uh, you've totally got my back on that one because that is exactly what was put upon my heart two weeks ago or three. Step up your game. Cleansed That's every wit from your iniquity that you might, as lecture six on faith says, that you might have the confidence in the Lord. The confidence isn't isn't that he can't do it. The confidence is, can I be a vessel to do it in his name? And that's what the Lord... And now we're right back again to Joseph of Egypt, that he was willing to trust God, and he was willing to be the tool, to be the vessel, no matter what God had to do to prepare him to be there. I had this powerful experience in the last two weeks, and I put that challenge to you. Cleanse Cleanse the iniquity from your life, but not so you can mark a check mark on the board. Be a puffed up beef from. Yeah, so that you can do the service that's going to be required at our hand in the days to come. That you might have pure faith. So this time that's coming, this seven years of Jacob's trouble that's kind of on our doorstep, take faith. Because, you know, if I was on Enoch's team, Christ's team actually, but where I could see that he could change rivers and move mountains, is there anything to fear? No, there's nothing to fear. I remember the dream that the stock rises up and saves Israel. So rise up, Ephraim, rise up. Israel, let's make it so. We're to the end of this presentation. Kind of got shown this little presentation of our good friend Mike here. Some people have done some really cool stuff with Daniel's numbers. And he's going to probably share that with you here at the end. (laughs) And at that, we'll call it. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Hey, my name's uh, Roger Hall and my wife, Jill. And uh, we're from South Ogden. And uh, this is from. Pickering's Modium. Am I saying that right? Anyway, I put this on my an application that does a countdown. Mm-hmm. So I have the solar eclipse is in two years, one month. And anyway, and so I have the feast of dedication. <laughs> I have the trumpets. I, I call it the rapture, but this is Adam and the taking up. And then I, 
that has the second coming. You can't read the date there, but it's September 2034, 12 years, six months and 18 days, and I have the Feast of Dedication. I'm still not sure what that is, but... That is so cool. Please like us on YouTube. If you enjoy our videos, please consider a donation. Our video podcasts and presentations are mainly a labor of love and need generous financial help to continue. Just scan our Venmo code with your smartphone's camera and click on the link.